It's good to see you this morning. Happy July 4th. How you doing, Jerry? Hey, brother. Hey, Mike, are you okay? All right, praise the Lord. Hi, Dennis. How you doing? Doing good. How about you? I forgot your string. Oh, I knew that. <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, uh, be praying for my wife, Miss Kathy. She uh, was at the store yesterday and tripped over one of those parking blocks that somebody pushed out in the middle of the aisle there and did a, a little nosedive. Made her stay in bed this morning. She's all kind of bruised up and sore, but uh, she'll survive it. She lives with me. <laughs> so she's tough, amen, and used to it. Not that I beat her up, so don't take that wrong, all right? At least in a physical way. I might be mean every once in a while, but uh, be praying for her. She did get some cuts and scrapes and stuff, and uh, told her she could stay at home on one Sunday. She comes to church twice every Sunday, so we'll let her stay home. But put her in your prayers, amen? I know you, she'll appreciate it greatly. We're in this series of messages on the miracles of Jesus. Can you believe we're in week 15 already? This seems to be going by so fast. I love these, these, these passages from the New Testament. One, because these reveal so much about the Lord Jesus himself. And uh, just to get to enjoy just seeing more of his, his personality and his character and the way that he operates and ministers and moves in life and through life and the way he dealt with his disciples and with, you know, the, with the multitude. So we, we get a great picture of the Lord Jesus. Same time, the miracles are a demonstration, as we said, week in and week out, that the word literally translates sign. So they are a sign and a demonstration that he is who he, he declared to be. He is the Son of God. Uh, the disciples have been taking a little bit to get all that in, and now at the last of the ministry of Jesus, even with this miracle, uh, we started with last week, we did it in two parts, but we discovered that it closes with a real in, uh, understanding on their part, this is the Son of God. You know, this is the, He's the Christ. He's not just the Messiah, all right? He's not just somebody who's sent to deliver and to save, but he's, he, he is literally the Son of God. That God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And this is, this is now, we're, we're seeing them with this revelation. But also we see in the miracles there's a very practical lesson uh, for us today. That there, there's, there's all kinds of uh, symbols and types and, you know, uh, messages from this for our practical life. If we'll take the time to look at it and listen and hear what the Spirit of God would say to us. Because there's some great lessons in the miracles. So we've gone through many of them. And again, we're uh, dealing with the same miracles we dealt with last week. Because there's just a lot here to absorb. And the, we, we are getting to the ministry, the end of the ministry, of, a, of the earthly ministry of Jesus th at this point. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the miracle of the walking on water. Plus, every time I read it, I, I, I am amazed. You know, I'm one of those guys who's just naive enough to believe the Bible's true. Amen. I really do believe it's true. And I don't believe that this is a fairy tale or some kind of simile or illustration or exaggeration. I really do believe Jesus walked on the water. I mean, I really do. I, I'd love to have been there. I understand the disciples when they see him coming on the water. and It's a ghost! You know, I would too. Uh, because it doesn't make any sense. They've seen him already, you know, calm the, the winds and the waves with just speaking to it. Boom, everything's silent. But now, now they seem come walking on it. So it just, it's like every miracle he does. But, you know, you think you've seen something, what's this one, you know? It's just that, it's that, and I know that's not the reason. The reason, again, is to demonstrate his glory and his authority and his power over all the natural forces of creation because he did create them. And every law of creation he put in place, whether it was gravity or whatever, he, he's an author over those, but it, just, it is just, as you watch him just mount and mount and mount, it's, it's amazing uh, the message is so clearly seen of his, of his deity and his authority over all things. He's the Lord. Jesus is Lord. In case you had not got it yet, he's the Lord. Uh, I mean, he sits on the throne of glory at the right hand of all authority, God the Father, and holds all authority and power, all right? He's big stuff, if you don't know. This means, uh-huh. Okay. We'll get off this point when you get it, okay? He really is the Lord of glory. So as we look at this, let's look at the Scripture again and read it again as we did last week. Immediately he made the disciples. This is immediately following the feeding of the thousands. He made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And after he'd sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and when it was evening, he, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, uh, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, 
take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, well, Lord, if it's you, then you command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat. Catch this. He walked on the water and came toward Jesus. For those who will put Peter out of the boat in a second, no, he walked on the water first, all right? Uh, and he came, but seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and he said to him, you have a little faith, why did you doubt? When they got in the boat, the wind stopped and those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, you are certainly God's son. There is no doubt about it now. You certainly are God's son. So we see this great demonstration of the power and the glory of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and just conquering, commanding all the, the, the physical laws of nature. Not only from walking the water, but calming the storm and then getting back the boat. And there these guys begin just to worship him, understandably so. Hopefully you would worship him as well in this, in this kind of situation. Last week, just kind of review real quickly, we talked about what does this mean to us and how do we relate to this. Well, I think there's a lot of ways that, and a lot of messages to us if we'll, we'll stop and listen to them. Obviously, the boat can clearly represent this, the present world that we're living in, the, the rut and the routines of life where, where situations and circumstances and, and things control your life. You, you, you probably heard me use the illustration before. Most people kind of live their life like, a, uh, like they're stuck in a pinball machine, you know. The ball's loaded into the little delivery device and it's pulled back and Bam, the ball goes. And that represents so many people's life. They fly up, you know, the little, the little pathway and out past the, the flapper and out into to the world. And they hit this bumper and that bell and this whistle and that bumper. And, you know, that thing throws them out and that pushes them over there. And, and that's the way they kind of just, at, at the mercy of general things of this world, they, you know, that's the way life is if you don't know Christ. It's, it's one problem or one thing or one issue or one trial or one storm. And you just kind of react and you just kind of react to, to whatever the situation was. That's not the way God intended man to live his life. We're not reactors, all right? We, we, we have authority that Christ puts in our lives so as to live our lives in victory. You know, not being at the whim and the will of the economy or the circumstances or the, the affairs of the world around us. You know, life can mean something, and so few people get it. So the boat really represents, you know, the commonplace. And for Christians especially, that just getting stuck in a rut. You know, the routine of, I do this, I do that, I might read my Bible, I might pray, I might, you know. And, and, and life as a believer is far richer and fuller than just kind of going through the, the motions of, of, and the rituals of Christianity. I mean, God has a purpose and a plan for your life that's, 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 that's rich and full and complete. And you need to discover that. But you're, you're never going to discover it if you don't take some simple steps of action and faith and trust God in what he's saying to your life. Also, the, the water can represent easily that taking that step of getting out where Jesus is. It's, it's a life of divine uh, dependency. I, I'm going to trust God. I really, I'm going to trust God here. I'm not just going to say I trust God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to let God, you know, direct my life. I, I'm going I'm to find out what God wa wants and, you know, Praise the Lord, I think I'll do it. You know? I, I mean, really, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to say I'm doing it and not do it, and I'm not going to pretend to be doing it, because that's where a lot of people are stuck, wouldn't you agree? You know, we all say, How, how's it? Oh, just praise the Lord, God's good, you know, and we're just miserable. You know, we're not happy. We don't find fulfillment. No, there's no completion. So that's what that represents. For someone who doesn't know Christ, you've never really given your life to him, it means you've got to get out of the boat of trusting yourself and being battered by the storms of the world and get out where Jesus is and take that step of faith to commit your life to following Jesus. And you, this personal relationship, this personal life, this, this glorious relationship where God changes your heart and forgives you of your sin and comes into your heart and life, you become a new person, that, that's the starting point. For the Christian, a lot of Christians, you know, they, you know, obviously to be a Christian, you have to have done that, born again. They've entered the new birth, but now they've just kind of settled in to mediocrity, all right? And, and it's just where it is. That, that's where their life is. And, there, and there's, no, there's no enthusiasm there. There's no real burning passions there that's just kind of going along with everything that's going along. Let me catch you up real quick. Last week, we, let me kind of review you know, some of the things we talked about last week. Some things you should know before you get out of the boat. One is, you know, that the invitation to get out of the boat usually comes in a storm. Maybe things are going haywire in your life. It could well be God's trying to get your attention, speak to your heart. 
And so this invitation to get out and really trust him and make a decision to really believe him could be right in the middle of the crisis that you're going through. But it's never meant the storms that come in your life. If the Lord is sending those storms, he's not there to try to sink your boat. He's there to get you out with him and to walk with him. They're there to enlarge your life, enrich your life. You know, They're there not to endanger you. The third thing we said, it's there to help you get your, your identity straight. What's important? Who's important? Who you are, who he is. If it's you, Christ, come, let me come to you. That, that was the big question. And Jesus said, it's me. So the, the issue here is, is who's going to be in charge and who are we going to look to, who are we going to believe? The fourth thing we said in this regard was it is an opportunity to have some real victory, not, not what I call camp meeting victory or, or revival meeting victory or even youth camp victory. You know, that's a start. That's when God speaks to you and you, you, you get challenged, you know, and your heart gets challenged and you, you, God says something to you. But now it's time to let's do what he says. There's a lot of people who in meetings and, and things will, will come to an altar and pray and say, Lord, you know, I surrender all and even sing the song. But when, when the time comes to walk away from the altar and get out to where life, you know, where the rubber meets the road, so to say, where you, know, where you get out there in the world where you say, hey, I really am surrendering all. I really am going to trust the Lord. So make sure that it's not just a momentary thing. The second thing we talked about was what are the reasons for water walking? Well, obviously, I'm just sick and tired of the old, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. You ever felt that way? Uh -uh. I'm just, this, this is, this, is this what God wants? You know, this, this, is, this is dull. And this is born. One thing you find out when you really get all on board for Jesus, all right, really get out there where he is, you find out that, hey, it's anything but boring. Yeah. You know, Christian life is just, for a lack of, you know, and it's almost absurd to use this terminology because it's so much deep in this, but it, it's fun. <laughs> you know, I'm having a good time. Amen. You know, the devil never treated me this good. Maybe he's doing you all right. all right. I doubt it, okay? But maybe you think you're getting all... Hey, you got nothing. If you're not out there where Jesus is and living for Christ, it's boring, you know? And it's, it's explainable, all right? It's understandable. You can make sense of it. Hey, but when you start walking with Christ and you start seeing what God can do, I mean, it's amazing how God just rearranges the world out in front of you when you start looking and seeing what's going on. It's just... You just see God. You start seeing God in your life. You start seeing God in your situation and your circumstances. And no longer you're that silly pinball being beat up by the bumpers of life, all right? Just being pushed to and fro. It makes a difference. So that's a pretty good reason. It's just boring in the boat. The second thing is, hey, you get to be with Christ. And by the way, for those who have not yet got it, that's what God's will is for your life. For you to be with him. For you to walk with him. For you to know him. You know, and, and so I was telling Kathy, I said, you know, I just love my big brother. <laughs> and I said, let me tell you something, but he's also my Lord, and he's also my Savior. And I have two other big brothers, but they're nothing like Jesus, all right? But they're good guys, but they're not like Jesus. There's nothing like Jesus. There's no one like him. And if you, you get back to understanding this whole thing of Christianity is a love relationship. I love Jesus. You know, it's like the video you watched a while ago. I'm a simple guy. I love Jesus. Love my country. You know, love my family. I'm a simple guy. And the, and the beauty of that is, it, the pro, it, it is profoundly simple. I love Christ. We ought to be at the place where we're not ashamed to say that. I mean, how many of you would be willing to be on a video like that that would be shown to the whole world like that says, I love Jesus. Amen. Some of you would say, well, if it's shown in church only. <laughs> if they just show it in church only, I'm all right with it. How about we just air it at workplace, put it on everybody's computer. I love Jesus, and there's nothing wrong with that as well. Amen? I love the Lord. Now, we also talked about last week is, is, is the requirements for water walkers. You, you know, your desire to get to Jesus has to be greater than your fear of the unknown. Your fear has to be put aside. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. But you also have to have a, a, a willingness to, to fall flat on your face if necessary, to fail. Peter failed. But what it also takes is a commitment to Jesus, because it's really all about him. If that's you, Lord, bid me to come to you, he said. But it also takes a commitment. Jesus said, come. Jesus calls you out to something. Jesus calls you up to something. Jesus calls you for something. Hey, you can move out because you have a commitment. If the Lord, whatever the Lord says to do, he will underwrite, all right? He will empower. He will embolden. He will strengthen. He will encourage. He'll give you what you need. But 
As we said last week, you're going to have to take a step. You're going to have to get out of the boat. Now, this week, we'll do just a couple of things. One is the do's and don'ts. If, you, if you're thinking, hey, you know, I, I'm ready to get out on the water, you know, that's not an invitation to run to the pond that's about a block back over this way and start walking on the water over there. It is an invitation to say, I'm going to get out where Jesus is. I, I'm going to really discover what this thing Christianity is all about. All right, not what just I've heard or what I've said or what I've said, about, but really what it's really all about, of, of giving God the opportunity to be God in my life. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Well, there's some, you've got three do's and two don'ts for those who like rules, all right? Uh, one is, if you do, don't look at the waves. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he, he was afraid, and he began to, he, to say, well, he cried out, you know, as he began to sink, saying, Lord, save me. Problem one, he got his eyes off the Lord. Isn't that pretty clear? So you don't want to look at the wind, the waves. You don't want to, you know, respond to the wind. It says the wind was very boisterous. In other words, it was very loud. It's very strong. It was opposing him. But if you're really going to get serious about living for Christ, then you've got to look to Christ. You know, you've got to get to the place in your heart and say, you know, the most important thing in my life is, is keeping myself focused and looking to the Lord because I, I can't be a wave watcher or a wind worrier because I will be sure and be one of those people who's going to sink. Isn't it amazing? As they get there, uh, Jesus is out there on the water, and they're saying it's a ghost. What does the Lord say at this point? Be of good cheer. You know, there's some people like that that you just can't stand. <laughs> you ever been feeling really bad about something? Oh, it's, be, be happy! <laughs> and you want to say, I think what make me happy is pop you right now in the face. You know? <laughs> Shut up. These guys are afraid, you know. And he comes in and he says, hey, be of good cheer. Well, the boat's going down. Be of good cheer. The wind, hey, we're in here bailing water out just to stay alive. You're saying be happy, you know. Be of good cheer. And, and the word really is, is not really has to do with happiness in, in the original language. It has to do with confidence. Take courage is what he's saying. Take courage. Don't let fear destroy your life. Don't let fear keep you back. Don't let fear hinder you at this point. Take courage. And, and the whole idea of this word is, you know, is, is daring boldness. You know, just be bold in the, in the face of all these things. Be of good cheer. In fact, it's the same thing when Jesus was telling the disciples prior to his leaving. Some of the last things he said to him were in John 14, 15, 16, you know, and 17 right in there, right prior to Gethsemane. And he's meeting in the upper room. And he, he, three times he tells them in that, in that little discourse, through those chapters, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. In this world, you'll have tribulation, he said. There's going to be a lot of storms and there's going to be a lot of trials, but be of good cheer. In other words, be confident. Trust me. Hold on to me. Look to me. Believe me, I'm God over all these things. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, even in tribulation. Why? Because I'm greater than all the things that are out there. Take courage. If it's you, then bid me to come to you. Come. What was the return call? And there he goes. He bails out of the boat, and he's headed. But verse 30 says, when he saw the wind boisterous, and the word boisterous is, a, is, a, is a, in the original language of the Greek there, it's iskuros, and it's a word which literally means forcible, powerful, strong. How many of you have ever gotten out when those, those storms come through the Houston area, those tropical storms and those, those uh, hurricane winds come, and you're standing out in those 40, 50-mile-an-hour winds, maybe doing some stuff in the yard or whatever? Those are powerful winds. They push you around. There's a lot of pressure. The Lord's saying, even in the context of this, don't worry about it. Trust me in this. But he looked at the winds. He saw that they were forcible. They were making an impact upon him physically and emotionally and mentally. And he has to resolve to either look back to Christ or be focused on these things, and he makes the wrong decision. Yeah, we, we all think, I think we all know that we're really governed by the things that we focus our attention on. You take a guy who can't overcome sin in his life. There's a particular stronghold. He keeps coming right back to it, coming right back to it, coming right back to it. You know, you know why, I mean, if, you, if that's you today, that's you because that's what you're looking at. Yeah. You, you've heard me use the illustration before. You cannot, if you're on a diet, stare at the refrigerator. <laughs> Can you? Nope. I mean, if you're on a diet, let me give you a little hint. Stay away from the frozen food aisles. That's where the bluebell is. And the frozen pizzas are, and the frozen desserts are, all right? It just doesn't make sense for you to go in. But that's what so many people do. They, the, Satan throws this temptation before them, and all of a sudden they're just locked into it, frozen by it. That's all they see. 
You need to do exactly what Peter did. Say, Lord, save me. And look to Jesus. You've got to look somewhere else because you will be governed by what you see. You, you remember the story of, the, of Elisha's servant? And they were, at, you know, I think at Dothan. And the king had sent these, these soldiers out to capture them. And the servant wakes up and he sees that they're surrounded by all the enemy. And he starts crying out for fear. And he wakes up Elijah. You're going to kill us. They're going to surround us. They're gonna, we're going to be dead before the, you know. You, you can almost just see him. He's just motivated by fear. What are we going to do now? We've all gotten there at some point in our life and said, what are we going to do now? Elijah kind of stretches. Oh, Lord, open his eyes. Now, I don't know that Elijah saw anything more than what he was seeing, but in his heart he knew that God before who could be against us. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw around them, outnumbering them massively, were the angels of God. Another army was in operation. And you can be sure that whatever the enemy is throwing at you, God has something greater just outside of your vision, but it's still there. The Bible says, even though we do not see, we believe. And when we put our faith in him, it's amazing what he'll do, but we have to get focused upon him. Peter, he says, why did you doubt? He became afraid. Doubt entered his heart. What do I have to do? Take courage. Choose to believe. Trust God. This is what it really means to get out of the boat. So, don't look at the waves. Don't get distracted. Number two, don't listen to the boat. There's always somebody in the boat to talk about it. But you're going to have to get out of the boat. There's all kinds of people who talk about soul winning, but not a lot of people doing it. There's a lot of people talking about studying the Bible, but not a lot of them actually doing it. There's a lot of people talking about having finding their ministry in life and finding what their spiritual gifts are and getting plugged in and you being used by God, but not a lot of people doing it. There's a lot of folks in the boat. They are professional boat riders. <laughs> and when you try to buck the system by saying, I, I really want God to do something in my life, I'm, I'm out here. Oh, 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 come back, come back here. You've never done that before. You, you, you can't be doing that. That people, maybe you haven't heard, but that's not natural. It's not normal. People don't walk on water. But Jesus, that's Jesus. Do you think you're Jesus? So there's all kinds of people that would be glad to just tell you, you know, you can't depend on people to give you the right answer. You've got to take the time to hear what the Lord's saying. That's why Peter affirms it and confirms it. If it's you, Lord. At the same time, there's always another voice. Sometimes it's from your own self, and sometimes it's from those around you say, oh, don't do that. You won't be happy. No, don't do that. That's no fun. Don't do that, you know. You know, you have to take a step of faith. You have to trust God. Now, obviously, there's probably some people in the boat that tell, oh, you want to be a water walker? Well, you need to come to our class. And we'll show you how to water walk. We have a manual for that. There's always professionals, you know, and experts, but we know what those are, amen? But you have to say, where am I going to trust God? I, I can't put my, my faith, especially I can't, any real terminal faith that makes a difference in anything but the Lord Jesus anyway. The third don't is don't look at your feet. That's always going to cause you a problem. And this is where a lot of people get in their spiritual life. They get to looking at what they've done or what they've accomplished or where they've been. And they get this attitude, well, I've arrived, you know. And what happens, if that's you, let me, let me give you a little test by which you can go by. You become critical and unteachable. Why? Because you're spiritual now. You get to the point where you lose your humility. And by the way, when you lose humility, you lose real power with God. You get preoccupied with your own little life. What's important is your spirituality, and, and, and you forget about the world and others and the needs of others. It's all focused on you. And anytime you focus on you, you're going to sink. You're in trouble. Those are the don'ts. Let me give you two do's right quick, all right? Do one. Do look to Jesus. The obvious is not looking at your feet, not looking at the, the waves or listening to the, to the wind howl around you or, or looking and listening to what the boat might say. You do take the opportunity to say, hey, I am going to, to trust the Lord because the wind will rule out the Savior or the Savior is going to rule out the wind. You know that song says, when sorrows like sea billows row? What do you do when the sorrows like sea billows row? You look to Jesus. What do you do when the trials come in life? You look to Jesus. What do you do when those strongholds, those temptations that used to overcome you and capture your heart and mind, no longer now because you look to Jesus? What do you do when there doesn't seem to be any answers to the crisis that you're in or the heartbreak you've experienced in your life? You look to Jesus. What do you do? 
When, you, when you're out on the sea and there doesn't seem to be any other course of action or any way to, uh, any way to find help, maybe you're sinking and drowning, you feel like, you look to Jesus. What do you do when there doesn't seem to be any light anywhere? You look to Jesus. There's never a place in your spiritual life where you're strong enough to do it on your own. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So what do we do? I just, I just want to take the opportunity this morning to say, hey, look to Jesus. Don't know what you're dealing with. Don't know what you're hassling with. Don't know what the problem might be. Don't know what's going on in your finances. Don't know what's going on at your house. Even though you may think I read your emails, as I said before, I don't work with the NSA. I don't get to listen and look. But the Holy Ghost of God knows, all right? He knows where you're at. He knows what you're dealing with. Look to Him. You can trust Him in those situations. Do look to Jesus. Do number two. Do remember. It's not you, and it's not your great faith. It's your Father. It's the Lord. And a lot of people, they get this idea, well, I would do something. I just don't, I just don't Pastor, I, <laughs> I just don't have no faith. I, I, you know, you got great faith. I don't have any faith. That is so bogus. Yeah. You know, that is, that is such a cop-out. I hate to tell you that. You know, if that's been your gig, I'm sorry. Amen. That stinks. It doesn't hold water, even as a good excuse. It's not a good excuse, you know? Some of you have a little better excuse than that. That's a terrible one. If you're going to look for excuses, find a better one. Because that one, that's, I mean, the Bible automatically has God given to each of us a measure of faith. So, uh-oh. Uh-oh. What do you mean? You know, God's given you what you need. If that's what you... If, if, He's given you the faith you need. Now it's that take courage, be confident, be of good cheer. Put your confidence in Him. He's the object of your faith. It's not your faith, it's what you're putting your faith in. You understand? And we are putting our faith in God. We're putting our faith in His Word. We're put, is God faithful? Is God a liar? Is God true? We have to make that decision. And if God's not a liar, and God can be trusted, and God is faithful, then I can put my trust in Him. And it's not my great faith, it's His great grace. We put our trust. And so we remember it's not about, not about what I've experienced, even in the past, what I've done. Well, I can come to this place. I can trust Jesus. Jesus asked him, why did you doubt? Why well, he doubted? Because he let fear in his heart. Why he let fear in his heart? Because he started looking at what was going on around him. So it's time to pull up your eyes from where you've been looking and listen to what you've been listening, because again, all those things will affect us mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. So we say, all right, in my heart, you know, I am determined now to look to Christ. I don't want to doubt. The, the word there, doubt, in the Greek language is ologopistos, and it's, the, it's from the word, the, the latter part of that word is pistos. It, it, there's the word pistuo, which is the word for believe in the Greek language. When the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a little phrase called pistuonice. All right, which it literally means to move towards an object. I'm trusting this. I'm believing that. I'm responding to what is out here as truth. And so I move, I, I, my faith is, uh, is just simply an action to trust and embrace. All right? I'm moving away from this. I'm moving to him. I'm moving to his word. And I'm, I'm not going to come to this place of lacking confidence. I'm going to take confidence. I'm going to believe God. And what happens when I believe God? God moves. And what we have to see here, I, maybe it's just this place of desperation where Peter says, Lord, save me. Well, the Lord did save him because he looked to the omnipotent, powerful, great God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why'd you stagger? Why'd you doubt? We just chose not to. Now, let me close this this morning with giving you a few things, what we call rewards for water walking, all right? If you're thinking, hey, I'm ready to bail out of the boat of commonplace, I'm, I'm you know, and maybe you used to be a water walker, you know, and now you're just a boat rider, and you're just coasting along with the group. Well, there are some benefits here, and one is this, the most important one, you know, the secondary, but you get to leave the boat. What's that mean? You get to say, okay, I'm not listening anymore to the you can't, and it won't work. And it's not normal. And that's not right. I, I, get, to, now I, I get to get out of that crowd who's not going anywhere but the wrong way. 
or they're not going anywhere. And maybe it's a crowd full of Christians and their boat's stuck out in the galley. The wind is strong. They're not going anywhere. All right? Jesus has been having a prayer meeting. They've been out there <laughs> bailing water, rowing hard as they can. Nothing's happening. They're wore out. They're defeated. Hey, that's a fun crowd. First church of boat riders. You don't want to be a part of that, do you? I don't want to be a part of that. I know you don't want to. So we get to move to a new level now uh, of great. Paul said, you know, it's for, our Christian life is from glory to glory. And I, I really believe that means it's, it's from one dimension of knowing Christ and His grace and the beauty of His holiness to another dimension. It's a growing process. Till one day we move from this glory to the great glory where we're completely glorified in our body and in our life. But we get, to, we get to leave the boat. The second thing is this, you get to walk on the water. Anybody doing that lately? You know, you get to walk on water. You experience subduing instead of being subdued. When temptation comes, you have the ability just to look the devil in the eyes and say, I don't have to. That's freeing. That is incredibly emancipating. I don't have to. But you've done it all your life. I don't have to anymore. But you do, you used to, you, you know, you like, I don't have to. That's, that's, that's the power of grace in our life in, the, in, in regard to the victory we can have over Christ, where every demon may be saying one thing. You say, I'm experiencing the reality of Jesus right now. I ain't got time for you. I have something better. And you personally witness. And there are those, we, when we have times of testimony, even just standing around fellowship with each other, I hear some of the most amazing stories of the grace of God. You know, we talk about these coincidences and these God incidences. To hear God incidents where, where people see God literally just get on the scene and do something out of the norm. Do something that's not natural, or at least it was going in the flow of the natural. It just is contrary. God just did something. And, and some of you have great testimony. God just saved your marriage. When everybody else and everything else said it's over, it's done, God did a miracle. Brought love, brought grace, brought revival in the hearts. He saved your marriage. He touched your children. He saved their lives. He, he, he gave you uh, hope. But over and over again, I hear testimonies of the great grace of God. What God did, what God did, what God did. God's still doing. God's still up to things. God, di God didn't die overnight, and you didn't get the notice. He's still alive, and he's still well, and he's still working in families. He's still working in finances. He's still working in churches. He's still working in homes. God's still alive. You give him the opportunity to crawl out of your dead living and lifestyle of boat drifting, you might see what God can do. You get to get out there on the water and see God do something, and you get to fail. You say, oh, hold, hold on, those others sounded all right. This, does, this doesn't sound glorious as you've been talking about. Well, this is the great reminder that we all need occasionally of our inability to do things on our own. Less pride in our hearts and we think we've accomplished something and we've done it without Him. You need the grace of God on your life. And sometimes we need reminders and it's through our failures I think that we are reminding us that we have not yet arrived. And the great revelation that has to continually come into hearts is that we have to, we're inadequate in ourselves and we always need Jesus no matter what. I tell you, the greatest failure is to just not get out of the boat. You know, just never get out of the boat. Just get there where it's, you know, as we said last week, it's, it's, it's safe perhaps and cozy, but it's sterile. It's not life-giving. The fourth point is this. You get to be rescued. He cries out. He says, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. And by the way, cried out is a word, krazo, and it is a verb in the Greek language, which is usually used in relationship to a croak. Like a raven would croak, I heard ravens croak, or a scream. Anybody heard a scream? In other words, he didn't say, "Lord, save me." <laughs> the way people read it, and Peter cried out, "Lord, save me." I don't think it was like that. Yeah. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I'm seething. <laughs> save me! Help! A cry of desperation. And what happened? The Lord, it says, and immediately the Lord reached down and pulled him up. Listen, he experienced in that moment the power of God as the Lord pulled him back up on top of the water. I don't think Jesus threw him up over his shoulder and hiked him back to the boat. 
<laughs> Do you? In fact, one passage in the gospel says they walked together back to the boat. You know? They experienced, and he experienced, this great miraculous move of God of, of, of being saved. Now, we experienced that first in salvation, save me. Now, I don't think people ever get to that point where they really give Christ control of their life until they realize how desperately they need Christ. I can't save myself. I mean, woke up one morning, I just told my, I'm sick of living this way. Ripe old age of 21, I'd about experienced everything I wanted. Because I had. Everything I thought would make me happy, frolicking friends and party life. And I was miserable. I finally woke up and said, is this what you really want? You know? Uh, you've heard my testimony. How I woke up one morning and there was this picture on the wall of, 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 of a big bowl of pot. I like to smoke dope. That's past tense, L-I-K-E-D, like, all right? <laughs> and it's a big picture. It had all this paraphernalia and pipes and clips and stuff, papers all scattered around it. And it said on the side of the boat, good humor. I got out of bed. I was so mad at myself for wasting years and wasting my life. I tore that poster up about 40 pieces. <laughs> Threw it on the floor. Went to my living room, sat down at the table and smoked a joint. <laughs> Trapped. It wasn't good enough just to, to say, rescue. You have to say, Lord, the answer is in Christ or you stay in the same hole. It's not in turning over a new leaf. It's not in trying to be better. It's not in becoming a church member. It's giving your life to Jesus. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. That's the answer that we all need. And the one who saves us and rescues us is Jesus himself. You get, by the way, to get where you're going. God has a plan for your life. And it's far exceeds anything the world can offer. Or what you've probably been dreaming on your bed at night. It doesn't work for you that way. Where well, you're going to find the greatest fulfillment and happiness. God already knows that. Because he knows you better than you know you. You think you know yourself. But look how much trouble you keep getting yourself into. When you ignore him. Amen. We don't know ourselves, but he does. And he knows the way we've been engineered, and he knows the way that engineering works on us because he engineered us. He's the creator. And he knows that when we discover him and discover his will and discover his life, we discover what living is really all about. And we get to get where we're going, praise the Lord. You get to, you get to that place where you start understanding God does have purpose, and I'm going to discover it. You know, the greatest place you'll go in your life is wherever Jesus is leading there's no greater place than that. It's wherever Christ is leading. The last and the sixth point is this. You get to worship Jesus. It says, they got back to the boat and got in the boat. Jesus stood there and they fell on their faces and said, truly, you are the Son of God. By the way, worship, most people don't even begin to even understand. Some of you think you, you, you uh, first part of the service we do at Believer's Fellowship is worship. The second part is, you know, preaching. You sitting here receiving God's word is worship. Yes, it is. You going home studying your Bible is worship. You being a man of God, that's worship. You being a woman of God, that's worship. You being a young person in love with Jesus, living for Jesus, that's worship. You serving Christ on any level in your life, doing anything you're doing for the glory of God, even your occupation and your career can be an exercise of worship as I do this unto the Lord. And if your, your job is boring... Maybe you hadn't turned it into an act of worship yet. I want to do this job for the Lord. I want to do the best I can be, do what God would have me be in this way. I want to follow His will and purposes on my job. As a husband, as a wife, whatever it might be, that becomes worship. And the greatest thing about life and living is when, hey, there's that beautiful satisfaction that comes in your heart. We'll just call it peace. All right? A peace that God gives. A fulfilling peace that God gives when you're learning just to worship Him. The word there in the Greek language, and sometimes you get me tired of me saying that, but the words are important in Scripture. God gave us the word, and I believe it's inerrant, infallible, so every word is, is special from God. And God could have used a lot of different words when he gave us the word, but he gave us specific words. And this word in the language proskunio, it has to, it's the word we translate worship, but literally it comes from the idea of a dog bowing before his master, licking his hand. Now, that might not make a lot of sense to you. For you guys who were at the wild game feast this year, that made a lot of sense, didn't it? When you saw those dogs, all they wanted to do was please that trainer and that master of theirs. 
I mean, I went that guy out to his truck with him. He came over there the week before just to look at the church and stuff when we had him come in and to get one of the dogs out. And I thought, you know, he's going to drop that gate. Those dogs are out here, and it's a highway here. And Hey, if I had my dog in the back of that day, I'd drop the gate, he'd been gone. <laughs> How about your dog? You, know, you can whistle, scream all you want, but once he's out, he's out. You know, he'll come back when he's ready, like some of y'all. Because you hadn't learned worship yet. So those dogs, they're sitting there, and he only got one out, you know. But that's all right, you know. The other dog, it's in my turn later. He's just, <laughs> tails are wagging back there, just waiting. Tell, tell me something, you know. T- give me something to do. You know, he gets out, get out. He gets down. He gets down, he just, <laughs> sit, n- heal. All he's looking at, though, is that, that, that guy, that, that, that trainer. That's all he wants to see. What do you want? What's my name? Throw the ball. The ball, the ball, get the ball. Why do, why do I love the ball? Because you threw it. What am I going to do? I'm going to bring it back to you. So he brings the ball back. Goes and jumps over stuff, other stuff. And he comes right back to the master. What else? What else? What, what, what do we do? Well, that's worship. That's, so that's a good illustration, is it not? Yeah. That, that, that adoration that the animal had for his master. Just wanting to please him, just wanting to be next, just wanting to do something, you know? Just let me, what, what can I do? I love Christ. I love the Lord. I want to worship God. Whatever he says. Throw the ball, I'm chasing it. Because I get to bring it back to you. <laughs> that's a word, I think, that's somehow forgotten what it really means to worship. And it's a word which also had to do with, you know, prostrating, your, prostrating yourself out and worship and homage and reverence. The idea is it's this, this heart that's just willing just to please the master. Please the master. Because that's when I'm pleased. You know, that's when I'm pleased. Wouldn't you rather get out of the boat? But you fell down, he fell down, he got wet. Wouldn't you rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat rider? Yeah. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you rather just get out where the, where the Lord is? Or do you want to keep going the same direction? I pray not. I pray you get just miserable Holy Ghost miserables. It wasn't until I cried out, Lord, rescue me, that he pulled me out of the pit that I had made for myself. Would you stand with your heads bowed today? For some of you this morning, it may mean giving your heart and your life to Christ. For others, it may mean coming back to Christ, who you had a walk with at one time, and and you did a lot. For others, it may be as a Christian, you've seen where God's been telling you and calling you and leading you for something, and and you've been making excuses why you couldn't or why you can't and why it won't work.